Okay, this the importance of adapters for best force calibration results. Best measurement practice is talking to the end user and replicating via calibration how they are using equipment. So, of course, Morehouse is passionate uh, about making good measurements, uh, so I will be giving you every bit of information I can during this webinar. There's a lot involved in creating presentation on calibration adapters, so there's no way for me to complete the ins and outs of every step. But I will tell you what we have found to make the most impact on your measurements and your measurement results. So my name is Henry Zumbrun. I am the president of Morehouse Instrument Company. My contact information is here. Please feel free to contact me with any questions. If, even if you think you have them after the webinar or continuing a week later, please feel free to contact me and reach out. So what Morehouse does, we manufacture force calibration products. We calibrate force measurement equipment using standards with very low uncertainties. These standards allow us to lower the uncertainties of equipment sent to us for calibration. We manufacture all the adapters shown in this webinar and we help make help labs make better measurements. And this webinar today is going to last about 45 minutes and we're gonna cover common force measurement errors and how to reduce or eliminate them with using proper adapters. To start off with, we like to talk about old adapters, in particular service life of force calibration adapters. Uh, it depends on several factors, including design, number of load cycles, and magnitude of each load. Better material manufacturing quality control processes provide more reliable strength values for design engineers than 20 years ago. Look, we all have computer-aided equipment, uh, and then we need to test those adapters and use those adapters and make sure the models are okay. What we used to do, um, we used to use like, you know, grade eight for some tension adapters. We used to commonly use, you know, like a grade eight bolt, which was okay. Um, but using them for years and years and years, they fatigued. And once they start to fatigue, they eventually break. It's generally recommended that old adapters be inspected and replaced if they have been used for more than 20 years or 100,000 load cycles. And that's roughly about 10,000 calibrations. This picture is a grade eight bolt that failed after about 350,000 load cycles. Uh, newer designs are designed for a life cycle of at least half a million load cycles or 50,000 calibrations. You know, that may seem like a lot, but when you do, you know, 100, 200, uh, 500, 5,000, depending, 5,000 calibrations. At the end of 10 years, doing 5,000 calibrations, you're only at 50,000. But if you're doing like 100,000 at five years, you're you're almost at the fatigue point. So basically, the newer adapters, half a million and failure, failure close to a million load cycles, which, which for many people, it, it could last their lifetime or the lab's lifetime. And now that we have explained some of the safety recommendations, uh, let's start to discuss some examples where the proper adapters are going to yield better results. First, let's look at what labs are known to use because they just grab what they have to get by and do the calibration. However, there's a problem. If any of the, you know, any of your adapters look like the tension adapters in your calibration lab, there is a problem. You know, even straight thread rod can introduce misalignment issues as they can distort the line of force in non Morehouse machines. They can also distort them in Morehouse machines as well. Just a little bit of off center or, or loading, uh, the straight rod can't, cannot compensate for that. And any machine with a misalignment of uh, 0 0.01 degrees can affect the reproducibility of some load cells. You know, even our spherical adapters can only overcome about 0.1 degree of misalignment. So threaded rod's not going to allow you to overcome any misalignment virtually, but uh, the right adapters and the sphericals, you can overcome about 0.1. When we say that alignment, we're talking about, you know, keeping the line of force pure, uh, free from eccentric forces, and it's the key to any you know, calibration of load cells, basically calibration of almost any instrument. And I point out here that ASTM E74 does not address the various adapter types, but uh, there is a standard, it's the ISO 376 standard. It's what most of Europe follows, and that does address adapters. Um, and any adapter that is going to help accomplish this should improve, you know, calibration results. We look at that, accomplish what, you know, allow for a little bit of misalignment, and that's what ISO does. And they recognize uh, the importance of adapters and reproducibility condition of the measurement. Proper adapter use in accordance with ISO 376 Annex A, 
helps ensure the reliability of reported measurements. Annex A is not a requirement for labs to adhere to, but it is something good to follow. In general, the annex says 8.4.1 says load fitting should be designed in such a way that the line of force application is not distorted. As a rule, tensile force transducers should be fitted with two ball nuts, two ball cups, and if necessary, two intermediate rings, while compressive force transducers should be fitted with one or two compression pads. Now here are an example of some of the adapters we're starting to get into and talk about some of the adapters that Morehouse has or manufactures the picture of the TMA set, which is tension member adapter set. Uh, and then we have um, an entire, you know, quick change tension member uh, set there in the center. And then there's a cow machine showing a load cell in tension. And in addition to just, you know, calibrating load cells and other instruments uh, such as, you know, the more and more competent, more and more common instruments are instruments for the weighing industry, such as, you know, tension links is pictured in this diagram. And tension links really need the right adapter to perform to specification. Now I have a picture here and looking at this, looking at this tension link in the setup, uh, with the pin, our, our one clevis adapter here in our 120K dead weight machine, uh, I have a question. And the question is, do you think the output will vary by using different pin sizes on a tension member? So if you think about that, you know, we have a tension member who comes with shackles, uh, maybe I, you know, 0.15 difference. Is that going to make a difference, you know, in my, in my measurement or in my weighing? Well, the answer is pretty much yes, because here's a picture where the instrument is loaded with the proper pin diameter to 50,000 pounds. And then the next slide I'm gonna show, and this slide shows loaded without the proper pin diameter to 50,000 pounds. Now this is a 0.1% device, and we read 50,000 and 49,140. That equates to a difference of 860 pounds or a 1.72% error at 50,000 pounds from not using the proper load size, proper size load pins. So yes, there is a difference. My disclaimer here is tension lengths of this, all tension lengths of this design seem to exhibit a similar problems. Uh, and if you're unsure about it, you can test it using different, different size pins. From the manufacturer directly, is using correct correctly sized pins is critical. If links are damaged, highly used, or worn, decrease the time between recalibrations. The same size and style of shackle and pin used during operations should be used for calibration and maintaining pin orientation is best practice. More examples on pins here. Here's a sheet from, this is from Dylan, their clevises. If we look, the, look at this in more detail, we can see dimensions here that a 20 ton and a 25 ton, and we look at these, an EDX 20 ton takes a two inch pin, while an EDX 25 ton takes a 1.97 inch pin. And yes, using the 1.97 or 50 millimeter pin on the 20 ton device is going to produce an error if the end user is using a two inch pin. It is, it is that minute, that little bit of difference could put the device out of tolerance. And this is an example where a larger instrument takes a smaller pin. I don't understand why. I assume one is, as I said, for more of the, you know, 20 ton more of uh, more metric and the other one is more customary. So knowing this, Morehouse has developed a lot of clevises. Uh, we have standard clevis kits for almost uh, the more common capacities, like 120,000 pounds. We have a clevis kit for that that does, does several instruments. And if you go to the website, you can look all different pin sizes to make sure you're making the right measurements. And if we look at the sheets, we have common clevis part numbers and we have a list of you know the common kit versus the premium kit and all the clevises that can be calibrated using these kits so again that's on the website then we get into um air associated with a non-flat base on a multi-column load cell here's the actual test uh we observed on a revere multi-column cell the column to the left is with a non-flat base versus a uh, flat base, which really what we did was we, you know, uh, ground the base and we took off this this piece here at the bottom. 
So we look at these numbers with our non-flat base, and all we did was rotate the cell, you know, 120 degrees, 240 degrees, and we compared the differences, and I'm calling that those differences the percent error, you know, the maximum differences but by just rotating the load cell in our calibrating machine with a non-flat base. Then we flattened that we took this this piece off right here, and we actually sewn the other base. And when we did this, uh, you can see we still rotated the instrument, but the maximum error between the rotations dropped by more than four times. Uh, so a flat base definitely improves and can improve the results. Knowing this, you know, this is a big problem if the lab sends the load so in for calibration with a base and the lab calib calibrating the force measuring your device decides to remove it, that's a problem. There's other things that, you know, the lab should have the proper top and bottom plates. We're just discussing bottom plates now, but it, it, discussing bottom plates, a flat bottom plate may be needed to improve performance. It is often not recommended the, you know, in practice to load against the machine surface as it could be uneven or the ba base of the load cell could even deform the machine surface. So a pad protects that. And then picture left is a 60K rod end uh, style load cell with a spherical threaded adapter, co top compression pad and uh, load cell base. I mentioned it a little earlier about top pads. Well, the importance of top pads it's quite large. Uh, people are usually going for an ASTM E74 calibration, and the expected performance of that calibration at the first for force point is to be better than 0.25%. And here's a situation where the top pad is producing an error higher than than what one would think their actual error uh, or their actual uh, expected performance of that device would be. And this this is a test here we ran. There's the different dates. We have 4340 top lock versus a hardened top lock. And the difference here, uh, we took readings at 0, 0120 and took the average. And the difference is, you know, uh, roughly 0.31% uh, on, again, on something that someone thinks is going to be better than 0.25%. So it makes a very, very large difference what top block you actually pair with the cell. And we'll go into that in a bit more detail. Uh, I have two points to make on this topic, specifically the material with different hardness experience different amounts of lateral deflection under the same amount of load. This causes different amounts of stress between the block and the load cell. And then we get into number two, where flatness and smoothness of the block is important and that it will change the contact position on the load cell. The assumption is a uh, load cell has a radius, most maybe, you know, R17, and is designed to be loaded exactly at the center of the spherical section. But an unbalanced or non-flat block can shift the contact point off center. As the stress analysis on the left shows, a small amount of shift will change the stress distribution. The key to use the same adapters is in use as use. It is really key to use the same adapters as to it will eliminate a majority of what could be a very, very large error source. And then adapters should be manufactured not to produce off-axis loads. We deal more with flat on flat. Some people say, some engineers talk to me, oh, flat on flat may be better. It's not better. Flat on flat will produce additional errors as the material is never truly flat and side loading almost always uh, occurs. And then flat on flat will not direct the stresses to the gauges. So if we had that R17 radius and we load with a hardened pad, that's going to direct that force. If you can visualize it like a triangle, it's going to direct that force downward towards the gauge section and produce better reproducibility and better repeatability um, when the cell is rotated by using that. So look at that, look at general material. I said earlier that, uh, you know, if you load against the base of a testing machine that you could start deforming the testing machine base. Well, why is that? It's because material with lower yield strength uh, than what is being applied will deform until the maximum compressive stress is below the material yield point. And then deformation until compressive stress is less than yield stress. You know, a steep radius contrasts the force over a smaller area and may cause material to permanently deform. Therefore, we recommend having a Morehouse compression top lock made at any load. So, you know, if, if the material deforms on your cell or work hardens, that top adapter will be kept with a load cell and the calibration results will be repeatable. So it's a contained. You can deform the load cell against the top block and we want the top block to slightly deform because we do not want that R17 radius on this cell to deform. We'd rather have that top block deform and this to be married and treated as a, as a system where the top block is integral to the load cell. 
Uh, pictured above uh, in this set, there's a, our concrete set is the concrete set with top and bottom adapters. The 600K cell weighs about 25 pounds with top and bottom adapter. It weighs less than 40 pounds. This kit was designed as a for, uh, portable field kit for those doing E4 testing that want to calibrate concrete machines, uh, most likely compression concrete machines. We can also add that this, this kit can be used for 60K and down in tension if needed. And we talk about ISO 376, mentioned it earlier, uh, looking at compressive force transducers should be fitted with one or two compression pads. We have adapters for that. They're called out in 376. There's just some examples. And ISO 376 uh, recommends, you know, a base uh, for some of the load cells. So, again, this, this helps. Um, this helps align the force properly. Uh, here's an error source. Um, does anything look different comparing these two pictures? You know, look at these pictures, study them. You can see if, if I try to draw this line of force, you can see that maybe this device is an eighth of an inch off center. So what do you think the output, what do you think is going to happen? You know, I'm pretty close to being center, an eighth of an inch, you know, that's respectable. A technician could easily come out and, you know, misalign something by an eighth of an inch. You know, is it, is it really going to impact my cow results when I'm making a measurement? Well, in this load cell, it would have a significant input effect on the output of the load cell. The misalignment demonstration here is uh, with it aligned in the machine, you can see the reading there was negative 1.96732 millivolts and then slightly misaligned negative 1.98211 millivolts. And that's about a 0.752% error. And if we look at the overall uncertainty, you know, for those that are accredited or those that are doing their measurement uncertainties, and you, you account for a 0.75% misalignment error, what does that do? That means this device is a 10,000 pound load cell. At 10,000 pounds, my expanded uncertainty is going to be about 86.606 from site, you know. And the overall, you know, if I do not have that error, the overall uncertainty is about 10 pounds at the at the 100% force point or 10,000 pounds. So, a uh, slight misalignment producing uh, 8.66 times um, what's expected not good and then here's if we look at contributors here's the you know an ASTME 74 cal on the S beam load so you see that when we have the 9.95 pound expanded uncertainty then if we look at misalignment this becomes much much smaller and misalignment is the very very dominant as far as uh, overall uncertainty of the device what happens you know uh, there was an S beam load so what happens if we you know misalign a shear rub load so so here's a shear web load cell. I think everybody can look at the picture and see that, yeah, this is really misaligned. And we have a video online showing this. So in this, this scenario, looking at the same thing, remember we were at 85 pounds on the 10,000 pound S-beam. Here we're about half a pound, a little over half a pound. And our original uncertainty was about 0.41 pounds. So this, this Morehouse uh, shear web style load cell is not as sensitive to misalignment or you know off-center loading. It still does produce some error, but it's very minimal. Uh, if you're going to go out and do a testing machine and you're off a little bit on alignment, you should still get very, very good numbers uh, using this cell. If you're using an S-beam, not so much. But in general, we have tools. There are accessories. Uh, there are adapters that help with alignment, and we have alignment plugs, and they help eliminate all the error. Uh, you have your load cell alignment plug, and then pretty typically you're gonna have a machine, uh, some kind of base or loading surface with an alignment hole in it. And they help eliminate misalignment by providing a machined hole in the platen which an alignment plug will fit into and align the force measuring device in, in whatever you're calibrating. If it's specifically if it's a cal machine or another machine, if if you can do this setup, it's going to yield better results. Then we get into compression, uh, the top adapter. So Two adapters here that are highly recommended. Uh, one's better than the other. The ball adapter, picture top right, is is preferable. If the machine has a ball adapter, it often yields the best results. If the ball adapter does not exist, a spherical alignment adapter, which is pictured top left, will help align the force. You know, from the previous slide, some load cells are just more sensitive to alignment uh, and thread engagement issues, making adapters even more critical. 
Here's an example of one of those cells. Um, this is we did on a, it's a common type cell. There's nothing wrong with this load cell whatsoever. It's just the customer asked us, uh, they did not send their adapters and I, I started doing tests with this. And if you look at the two adapters here on the right, that someone could use uh, very easily. They're one with an inch and a half engagement and one with a half inch engagement. And we took two readings at 10,000 pounds. And between these two adapters, the readings varied by 59.2 pounds on a 10,000 pound load cell. Now, both would be yield very repeatable results, but if the customer's not using the one that we end up using for calibration, which was an inch and a half one, if they're not using um, an adapter with an inch and a half engagement, they could have significant error. So the error of this measurement was, you know, look, there's half a percent on a device uh, expected to be better than 0.25%. You know, it's 20 times expected. So you have to really be concerned about adapters and how your devices are being calibrated. The best scenario is to send in, if you have these adapters, is to purchase the spherical adapter, uh, pick a top adapter, and always use and have the force measuring device calibrated with that top adapter. And uh, in this example, Morehouse spherical load button would be an excellent top adapter for this load. So, you know, it's... We get into more, more error sources here and thread depth, shoulder loading versus thread loading. Here's a 3,000 pound cell. Uh, we did the same force points with these three adapters. And depending on what adapter was used, you can see the max errors all over the place. And this, again, this is a calibration where we're expecting better than 0.025% of full scale. And here that the 600 pound point, um, we have, you know, uh, 1.7. And at capacity, we have 0.58%. So something where we we're expecting, you know, zero, 0.025% uh, we're getting 0.58% here by just switching top adapter. So if you if the customer would send in the top adapter or if you have this type of these type of cells and you you know lock or fix in a top adapter, you will get repeatable numbers. So you know solution if you can this is the best highly recommended is purchase or purchase a cell with an integral threaded adapter installed or pick a top adapter and always use and have the force measuring device calibrated with that top adapter. And this example, a Morehouse spherical load button would be an excellent top adapter. And this is down here. Now, why would, why would this happen? Some people, you know, this cell is about four inches tall. That may be too tall for some limited space machines. You can get the, you can get the size down to under three inches with one of these, you know, spherical adapters. So this is a good case where, Recommended is the integral adapter. If you cannot do that because of space limitations, the next best solution is to, you know, have a spherical uh, alignment adapter that will help direct the force properly. Loading through bottom threads and compression. Here's two examples, two setups. Um, you know, do you think these loading profiles create a different result? Well, it is, it is a webinar on adapters, and we're talking about how the importance of adapters. So, you know, the obvious an answer, if you're listening, or watching is that, yes, there is a difference. And the difference is very predictable on all the all these types of shear web load cells. From, from loading on the right here, loading through the threads versus loading flat on the left, difference of about three pounds at capacity. And what is that in percentage? Well, if we look at this, it's about 0.012%. And we can do this test on a 10,000 pound shear web cell. We can do it on a 5,000 pound. We can do it on 100,000 pounds. And every time we do this test, we're probably going to end up with about 0.01 to 01, 0.12, 0.13%. It's very, very repeatable. But there is a difference. If you're making a critical measurement or if you're trying to maintain, you know, a CMC of better than 0.02, 0.01 is going to be dominant. It's going to be something that you're going to definitely want to address. Now, we have threaded adapters that can be used for loading through the threads in compression and or tension if needed. Engineering has d just designed different adapters than the ones shown here. They, we have newer adapters uh, for thread loading if that is something you need to do. Uh, most, most calibration providers will load the equipment on flat on flat, but some that are using the automated machines will load through the threads. It's really not a big deal. You just have to know how they're loading it and then replicate how it's being loaded so you can reproduce those results. And we deal with button load cells. Uh, 
quite common. These get a lot, uh, a lot of people have problems even trying to get these to calibrate. And they use a traditional setup where they use, you know, s some flat base and some, some piece of steel or flat ground pad. And then they do not, they try to, you know, do multiple measurements and they do not get anything remotely repeatable. In this case, the error, the deviation uh, between, you know, when we, when we try to, you know, account for reproducibility or we rotate the device. The percentage of error here is 1.045%, which is way, way too high on, on this type of cell. But we can limit that error if we use the proper adapters. And we designed uh, button load cell adapters. And these adapters improve the measurement result by about 525%. In this case, without the adapters, we had 1.045%. And then a uh, picture on the right here, with the adapters, we did the same test and still had quite a bit of variation, but nowhere near, um, you know, you know, it's, it's over 5.25 better. And on average, it's about five times better with, with these adapters. So again, you can improve the results here with these adapters and they're pictured. We have uh, button and washer load cell adapters. We have them on the website for all different size cells and configurations. If you're doing these, these are the recommended adapters. Uh, for the calibration lab to get the best result uh, for the for your customer base. We have aircraft and truck scale. Um, this is something that's becoming more and more common in the weighing industry. This has happened for years. Uh, manufacturer says, hey, this should be calibrated on a flat surface. And yet in use, they're using them on concrete. But that's what happens. So and these, these scales are typically used to weigh trucks and airplanes with tires sitting on several scales. Any adapter used during calibration should be composed of the same type of rubber and should have the same footprint as a tire to ensure accurate results. Now think about this. So they put a tire up. Tires all vary. Your tire pressure varies. They're on a concrete pad instead of on a flat pad. Manufacturers saying, hey, the, the performance, the accuracy of this device is 0.1%, and now we're throwing in all these variables. Uh, we even have some labs that stack weights instead of using this type of adapter, or they, you know, they don't use a rubber adapter that simulates the tire. So what we ended up doing, and which, which, which we're starting to collect more and more data on, are different tire footprints on scales. And here's an example. It's one of the several that we now have. I'm hoping to get at least, you know, 30 uh, sample, various samples. But right now we have a few samples, and I can tell you uh, without a doubt there is a large difference between the adapters that you use to calibrate the scales. Here's one where we're replicating the truck tire on the left versus using a smaller scale that we, or si a smaller size uh, rubber pad and adapter that we have on the right. And on a, on a device, uh, the difference on here, you can see the meter saturated with a small scale. I don't know why it's, you know, it just went beyond its output. But you can see at the last point we could take at 36,000 pounds, uh, we had a difference of about 1 point, you know, 306% or a difference of 470 pounds. Quite a large difference on a scale that maybe, you know, spec that 0.1, 0.2% of full scale. And we're already showing, you know, six, seven times that. So very important to consider. And then some of you um, use weights or lift weights um, for the handheld force gauges, which is fine. Uh, it's just the setup and the safety concern. If you're lifting, you know, 500 pounds worth of weights on and off of handheld force gauges, that could be a problem. In which case, we have we have built uh, and developed a PCM portable calibrating machine that goes up to 2,000 pounds, and all of those gauges, those handheld force gauges, typically have different centering distances and and different hole patterns. So we developed a kit that you know allows for calibration of the majority of those instruments with buying, you know, purchasing that quit kit for the PCM if interested. So, and the PCM also does, you know, can be used for load cells and other force measuring, you know, devices and instrumentation. So, you can calibrate almost anything to 2,000 pounds.
Large tension adapters. Many high-capacity load cells, 200,000 uh, 200, pounds and above, are designed with custom threads or fixtures. Safety and quality control becomes even more important at large capacities where mishaps can be life-threatening. You know, we have designed adapters up to 2.5 million pounds of force. Here's a picture of adapters uh, that go to, you know, 1.25 or 1.2 million pounds uh, or close to 5 meganewtons. So I have some questions. You know, you're listening to this this presentation uh, talking a lot about adapters and their and their errors and so some questions I would have for people are you know are you confident that your equipment is is calibrated properly you know after, after this discussion you know is, is the lab are you sending adapters into the lab is your force calibration provider following the proper standards and are they using the proper adapters you know what, what's the proper adapters it's it's really specified by the end user and what they're using. If you're using a piece of, you know, threaded rod, there's going to be different results than if, if we're using our, you know, tension member set that, that will compensate for, you know, 0.1% uh, misalignment. So, and do you have a set of adapters that you are sending um, the to your force calibration provider when you're having it calibrated? Are you doing that? So it's it's things to think about. Some some other parts to make communication with the customer is key to address these issues. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we're in the real world, and this does not only always happen. There are some third-party suppliers. You know, they may not relay messages to to their customer. They're purchasing departments that you can't get through to the end technician, and the purchasing departments just task with hey, get it calibrated. Then there's also management who just does not care. It's you know why why be bothered with uh, different adapters? Just you know provide the calibration. And then there's large companies where it's difficult to reach the technician using the device. I mean there we do a whole webinar on risk and companies, larger companies sometimes avoid these things that are very critical and can cost them a lot of money. Um, I will never forget one call I had with a, a, a one of the customers where we had an issue with one of their load cells, and we said, "Do you want us to fix it?" It would be about, you know, at that point it was about five hundred dollars to fix a load cell, and they said, "Nah, it's our backup cell. We don't care. We don't care, and we don't need it fixed." Well, the problem is if the main cell goes down and the backup cell is not working, how much equipment's going to be bad? How much of their, me how many of their measurements are going to be bad? What's that recall? You know, is it is it much more than five hundred dollars? Is it a million dollars um, you know you, ha you have things and you have these mistakes and, and it often sometimes it does fall on deaf ears but to minimize uh, issues with adapters the ideal solution would be to calibrate the device with the customers adapters the next best option is if you can't get them is to have the appropriate adapters that can be referenced ie you know this is a webinar from Morehouse ie adapters that we manufacture you can go back on the part hey I, we use this spherical um, you know, compression spherical button. We use this, uh, we use that, but uh, some of the things you can do. So additional measurement errors that we didn't talk about today, um, you know, cable stiffness. Uh, these are all different timing errors, having a TUR lower than one to one, what that means, uh, appropriate exercise cycles, all this, uh, all of that is covered in, in more depth and uncertainty analysis in our two day training class. And Reducing force measurement errors using the right calibration provider who has a measurement process and certainly capable of meeting your standards and follows published standards. Uh, making sure the calibration replicates how the instrument is being used by using the right adapters to ensure results are repeatable. And of course, having you know competent technicians. Some common issues with most uh, force calibration laboratories, CMC values are unrealistic. You know, we report realistic CMCs and wrote a guidance document on how to do force CMCs. If you're interested in that guidance document, please email me at hsumrun at mhforce. I'm happy to share it with you. Lack of understanding of standards. You know, we help draft several standards and guidance documents. Not property evaluating measurement risk. Uh, we report probability on false except on those instruments that need it and that is a requirement for 17025 if you're accredited uh, it's in section 7 uh, the lab does not replicate how the instruments uh, are used uh, by using the right adapters really we ask the questions and we always seek to replicate use uh, when possible I mentioned on other error sources and it's a TUR here's our TUR you know TUR is tolerance divided by expanded uncertainty 
you know, using dead weights versus using secondary standards, this gives us, you know, a high TUR, which is that test uncertainty ratio. Here's an example of a 10,000 pound load cell that we calibrate TUR 22 to 1, whereas if we use a secondary standard machine, you know, an automated sheet machine like most of the competitors out there are using, you get a 1 to 1 TUR. What does that mean? Really, it means there's more room to be in tolerance. In some cases, uh, the other supplier, when they don't account for uncertainty, properly, they cannot make a statement of compliance. So um, the larger the TUR, the lower the risk, and more room you have to be in tolerance of either side of the acceptance limits. And then often accreditation, you know, you think you're get, you think accredited, specify accredited service provider that that's not enough. It's often not. You know, we strive to be regarded as the best independent uh, force and torque calibration resource in the world by providing realistic solutions and continually develop new products to meet customer needs. We also like to defy the average and meet 100% on quality delivery and overall customer satisfaction. There's an example of that. And then we have, here's a summary of just some of the adapters we talked about for tension setups, multiple adapters. You buy you know, one set of adapters, you can do many, many things. There's adapters for the handheld force gauges. Here's the adapters for you know, tension links. These are adapters here for load cells. And then as I said, and Typically with adapter kits, we make more of them. We make batch quantities, so we reduce we reduce the manufacturing cost, and then we pass that on. Um, and now, uh, which we've been running for over a year now, uh, the the kits are discounted at 20% as a result of uh, as, as our better results promotion. A little more on upcoming webinars and trading. Uh, next webinar will be on various types of force machines. I know we've been asked to do this for a while. We're creating all new content uh, for this. Uh, we will discuss really advantages and disadvantages of several machines. You know, this will be from testing machines to, you know, force machines to calibrating machines, to hydraulic amplified machines, the lever machines, the dead weight machines, hoping to have all of that. But when you look at force machines, Here's what I want everybody to take away with, in, in addition to hopefully now thinking about adapters and the importance of the adapters after showing some of those errors of, you know, half percent, uh, you know, one percent or more on the scale, um, you know, 0.75, two percent of the misalignment of the S-beam. But think about your machines. Uh, in addition to those adapters, all force machines should be designed so they are level plumb square and rigid you know we're going to talk about this in the next webinar but if the machines if the machines are not rigid if they're not level you can have huge amounts of error if they are not square you're going to have misalignment and we saw that misalignment on that s beam had a significant error source so it's really important when you use machines that they're designed with these four things in mind and examples of machines, you know, there's a cow machine or with a tension link in it. There's a 10,000 pound bench top with an AP dynamometer and there's a 2,000 pound PCM. So, and Grace Hopper, who is a woman, I don't know why I, I got this image off the internet. Uh, I like to end with this uh, and I will open everything for questions. It says one accurate measurement is worth a thousand expert opinions. Uh, and that is so true. So thank you for being with us and I will open it for open up the discussion for questions.